like uh, in, in doubt here, and is the founding director of the Simon Center for Control Systems and Dynamics at the UCSD. So he also serves as a senior associate vice chancellor for research at UCSD. So he has been elected as fellow of seven scientific societies, including IEEE, IFAC, ASME, SAM, AAAS, IET, AIAA, and as a foreign member of the Serbian Academy, Academy of Science and Arts and the Academy of Engineering of Serbia. So he have received numerous awards, including Richard Bellman's Control Heritage Award, Sam Reid Award Prize, ASME Oldenburg Medal, Nyquist Lecture Prize, and many more. So he serves as Editor-in-Chief of Systems and Control Letters, and has been serving as Senior Editor in Automatica and attribute transactions on automatic control, as editor of two Springer book series, and has served as vice president for technical activities of the IEEE Control System Society, and as chair of the IEEE CSS Fellow Committee. So he has co authored 15 books on adaptive, nonlinear, and stochastic control, extremum seeking, control of PDE systems, including turbulent fluid and control of delay systems. So today, he'll be talking about the magical world of adaptive civilization and optimization. So during the seminar, if you have any question, please feel free to type that in the chat window, and we will have a Q&A session in the end. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Miroslav Kristek. Thank you very much, Bing, and thank you, <clears throat> Tiago. Thank you both for inviting me and giving me the, the opportunity to kick off this uh, seminar series, which is a fantastic idea to keep us uh, together and more frequently exchanging uh, uh, discoveries in uh, adaptive and learning systems. Uh, thank you all, nearly uh, 80 of you who have uh, dialed in and dropped into um, uh, to see my talk and, and be present. Uh, during this time. <clears throat> the title that I chose simply reflects, reflects two things. First, it reflects my fascination with the subject of adaptive control, a continuing fascination, no, totally unchanged uh, relative to 30 plus years ago. And it also reflects my indecisiveness to, to uh, uh, pick one thing to talk about. Okay, th thank you very much. So um, I want to start uh, start with a with a summary of what I see as uh, the major periods in the development of adaptive control for me personal. This is this is a, a talk on what what I've uh, uh, done in the field, and I, I cast it uh, cast the history in the in that context. Um, so uh, it's a field that's uh, been actively developing for about six decades. Or, or more. <clears throat> and I would say that the first 20 years were dedicated to uh, adaptive control linear systems. Uh, major discoveries like the design, and then the stability analysis, and then the re resolution of robustness, each of which took maybe a decade, uh, decade to uh, get general enough and um, uh, completely correct. By the way, there's this still remaining uh, light blue dot, which would be good to eliminate if the person uh, who put it in there is paying attention. Okay, uh, so for me, the major reference representing that first period of adaptive control, adaptive linear control, is uh, the book by Yana and, and Son. Um, which I uh, still hold in incredibly uh, high regard and uh, refer to uh, very often. This is just, just one representation of what is in there, namely control of systems that are linearly parametrized uh, in, in the parameters. Um, the topics covered there are more reference adaptive control, pole placement, and a few other things, as well as an emphasis on uh, robustness. I would say that the next uh, 
uh, period, maybe the 1980s, in parallel to the development of robustness, were a period of figuring out how to uh, develop adaptive control for nonlinear systems. And that was finally mastered around 1990 and, and the early 90s. And that is what I have personally been focused on in, uh, in the early part of, of my career, and it's captured uh, in this book on um, nonlinear adaptive control design, where um, uh, the parametrization remains linear, but the dependence on the state is uh, nonlinear. The design approach there is uh, the backstepping design. I'm sorry, I'm struggling here with a, with a cursor uh, uh, and, and clicking for some, some reason. I hope I, um, I figure it out soon. Uh, <clears throat> uh, following that uh, model-based fully model-based adaptive nonlinear control development, uh, um, uh, a period of maybe five to 10 years followed with a, with a big uh, focus on adaptive control using neural networks. And it continues uh, today, by, but the, the main discoveries, uh, the groundwork was, was laid in the late 80s and early 2000s, uh, focusing on um, adaptive control using neural networks and unstructured uncertainties. Um, for me, the last 15 years, in terms of my interest, uh, uh, have gone in light of the development of um, adaptive control for systems modeled by partial differential equations. Uh, for different classes of such systems, such as parabolic PDs, hyperbolic PDs, and delay systems. So I've put in a lot of work over, over that 15-year uh, period into, into this. Uh, early on, uh, came the effort with Andres Mishaev on adaptive control for PDs. Uh, the backstepping method was crucial there because backstepping allows you to design controllers that uh, have gain functions that explicitly depend on the planned parameters. And this dependence is what allows to uh, develop adaptive controllers for uh, PD systems particularly the indirect approaches. Um, the extension from parabolic to hyperbolic PDs is something that very, very much interest, uh, interested me, but the main developments following a first result that I had with uh, uh, Delphine Brush Pietri, the main development came uh, in the thesis work of Henry Confinsen with Ole Morten Omo in Norway. Uh, Ole Morten was a former student. Uh, oh my. And most recently, <clears throat> another development for infinite dimensional systems, this time delay systems, or if you wish, a special case of hyperbolic PDs combined with ODEs uh, is captured in this recent book with uh, Yang Zhu, who is uh, now a, a professor at Zhejiang University and was a postdoc uh, with uh, Emilia Friedman uh, just before heading back to China. So let me uh, show you briefly uh, two applications of such uh, adaptive control designs to infinite dimensional systems. Uh, one, the first one will be an application to um, a robotic manipulator uh, or a humanoid robot, which is a nonlinear system uh, where the delay is unknown. And the second result will be an application to a PD model of traffic flows. So first, the result by um, a San Diego student, Alex Bertino, <clears throat> developed and implemented on a 70 degree of freedom humanoid uh, arm um, uh, robot called Baxter. So let me first show you what's, what happens when you try to control, when, when you try to perform the motion with the uh, robotic hand, uh, using this robotic arm with, with a shoulder, elbow, wrist, joint, and so on, uh, in the presence of a delay. Imagine that the robot holds a cup full of water and its task is to move that cup of water, but there is a delay, uh, unanticipated delay uh, in the measurement of, um, of various uh, uh, 
uh, angles and angular velocities. You see what happens. An oscillation ensues, instability develops. I, I would call that it's, it's similar to what a person with a Parkinson's disease experiences, uh, the presence of a delay that induces um, instability. Okay, so here's a design for this system. A seven degree of freedom manipulator has too many equations for me to write them. So uh, I compactly write this as do, x dot equals f naught of x and u with a delay present. And that delay is modeled as a first order hyperbolic PD or simply the transport PD, because that is what, uh, what the delay is. It's a transport process with an emphasis on D, the delay being unknown. Uh, writing uh, uh, the model in this fashion uh, makes uh, the model linear in the parameter, which is which is crucial here. Uh, the objective is actually trajectory tracking, so uh, the state needs to be expressed in terms of the uh, tracking error z. Uh, the reference signal appears in here, as well as, as well as the derivatives of those angles and so on, and. And the key step uh, in the design, there are two key steps in the design actually. One is uh, developing uh, a PD based uh, predictor uh, state for the, uh, for the tracking error, a predictor state for the, uh, 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 for the input um, and for the trajectory. Uh, and then producing a control input, which is a prediction based, but adaptive prediction based uh, prediction uh, employing an estimate of the unknown delay uh, substituted into a nominal controller uh, for the delay free design for the, uh, this robotic manipulator. The key thing here is actually <clears throat> for us, uh, the update law, because predictor-based control in the, uh, in the presence of a known delay, that's not an adaptive problem. What's adaptive is, is uh, linked to the estimation of the unknown, unknown delay. And truly unknown with a, with a very, very large range of uncertainty around some uh, possibly initial uh, delay estimate. So this, the update law is given by this expression. It employs a normalization. Uh, it employs uh, an estimation error and a regressor. And it's not something that, that is quick to see what exactly motivates this design, but I can tell you that it's a Lyapunov-based uh, design with a, with, a, with a Lyapunov stability uh, or proof employing a, a lyapunov krasovsky type of functional, <clears throat> including the, the estimation error. And here's what happens when that um, adaptive version of the predictor employed controller is applied. So in the upper right corner, I'm running the previous simulation where the robot fails, where in the center, uh, actually, I'm sorry, these are not simulations. These are experiments which are rendered uh, using a feature for, uh, for rendering uh, visually what um, the experimental measurements on Baxter show. The reason for rendering it rather than showing on camera is that the lab is usually such a messy environment that, that it's actually cleaner to, to show the rendering of, of what's been measured um, an animation, so to speak, rather than, uh, rather than a movie. So what you're seeing in the, in the middle is the experiment uh, with a control that employs uh, this adaptive uh, estimation of the delay, and you see uh, that this delay est estimator starts um, uh, from a certain value. It doesn't kick in uh, right away because of the input delay. But once it kicks in, uh, it's a single parameter. So it's not very hard for it to converge, especially when, when the objective is trajectory tracking. So let me continue this movie. You see the smooth uh, transfer of, a, of an invisible glass full of water, which doesn't spill from uh, one point over an, op over an invisible obstacle to another. All right, so let's move on to the next application of uh, adaptive infinite dimensional control, this time to a PD. 
the PD problem is the problem of controlling the flow of traffic in a stop and in a congested regime um, where a stop and go instability uh, develops. So when you are in congested traffic, what happens is that, well, if, if you're in the, um, in the parts of the world uh, where the S, uh, SI system or measurement uh, is dominant, uh, you, you're driving at around 40 kilometers per hour. If you're in the sort of English measuring, uh, English unit uh, measuring world like the US, you think of it as 25 uh, miles per hour traffic, uh, slow but not stopped. And what happens is, is you know, you uh, the vehicles in front of you slow down, you step on the brake, you slow down. Then they move move ahead. They they speed up. You speed up. You 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 never know if, if this is finally cleared or or temporary. So uh, that is called the stop and go uh, instability. It's no different than 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 uh, limit cycle that we see in many applications, except that it's infinite dimensional. And the goal is not to decongest the traffic because we can do that only if if we if we keep vehicles from entering the freeway. No, we, we, we want the demands to be um, uh, followed and respected, uh, but we want the, uh, the oscillation to be suppressed. How is that possible? Well, actually it is possible using ramp metering. If you have those traffic lights that alternate between, between uh, uh, red and green, and which are usually set to a certain duration, certain, uh, a certain constant duration during the rush hour, they can be, uh, the, their duration can be varied around some mean. So without uh, keeping the cars from entering the freeway, but um, uh, using different, different, uh, diff a different ratio between the length of the red and the green light one can affect the traffic. How can one affect the traffic? Well, uh, if, uh, if you keep the uh, red light a little longer, uh, this will be less disruptive uh, to the incoming vehicles and they will tend to be uh, uh, not braking as a result of incoming vehicles merging into the freeway. Uh, and vice versa if you if you keep the green light uh, longer. Now, as the first vehicle that encounters the uh, merging vehicle responds either by accelerating or not decelerating or by decelerating, uh, that action is uh, affects the distance uh, between that car and the car or the driver behind that that car. and this, uh, reaction propagates upstream. So this is quite counterintuitive, but I'm talking about using traffic lights to affect, to stabilize the stop and go motion of traffic upstream of the actuator. The downstream, uh, that's kind of near, near trivial. It's the upstream using the behavior of wave, the, 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 the response of the, of the drivers to uh, the speed of the vehicles in front of the driver or the, uh, the distance that uh, I'm talking about. So there is, there is a wave uh, of vehicles and their speeds, but there's also a wave of responses or a, uh, or a density uh, wave heading um, uh, upstream. How is all of this modeled? Well, <clears throat> there are multiple models of traffic flows. Um, uh, some of them are called the microscopic models where you have numerous hundreds of actual individual uh, vehicles and driver models. And then there are also the macroscopic models, the PD models, where uh, the driver, uh, the, the, uh, the cars are modeled essentially as, as particles of gas, but not naively using gas dynamics. Uh, the model actually incorporates uh, the human beha behavioral uh, features. The model, uh, the classical model that emerged in the 1950s in the so is the so-called uh, Light Hill Witham Richards LWR uh, first order PD model, which models only the density. And in that kind of a model, you can have uh, shocks 
uh, uh, in the transitions between the free and the um, congested traffic, but you cannot have stop and go oscillations. Uh, it takes an additional PD, just as in gases, a PD for the velocity state, V, uh, to get a second order PD system in which oscillations and limit cycles uh, can ensue. And in that model, that model is not uh, the plain gas dynamics model. Uh, it involves two additional elements that I don't have time to, to physically get into the detail, but uh, uh, there are nonlinearities in here that capture uh, the risk of averseness or the risk tolerance of the drivers uh, in response to the density or the distance relative to the uh, car in front of them, as well as the driver preference to uh, drive at the, to regulate uh, uh, their own speed to a certain speed in response to the density. So when the density is, is low, we drive faster. When the density is high, we, uh, we uh, tend to uh, set our nominal uh, speed set point to a lower value. So that is a model, a nonlinear coupled PD model with, with certain parameters that are unknown. Uh, the, the risk tolerance uh, factors um, of the drivers are unknown. The driver uh, response time or the time to adjust to uh, a new um, density is also unknown. So lots of unknown parameters. This is uh, the, the traffic is a perfect case for adaptive control because how would you how would you know what you know how people behave and how would you know how people behave when it's uh, when the visibility is lower than than what you determined for some nominal case or when it's raining and how do you know how the drivers behave uh, at one hour of a day versus another hour a day. During one hour of a day, you may have younger drivers, more aggressive drivers. At another hour of the day, you may, you may, may have uh, a different kind of drivers. In the evening, you may have, have uh, drivers with yet another type of characteristics, maybe, maybe a higher percentage of people that had something to drink and so on. So a perfect case for adaptive control. Let me spare you the, the, the details. The, the derivation is quite complicated, I would say, to, to get to uh, the point where one can design, uh, invent these controllers, it's, it's, it's not a process of weeks, it's, it's a process of training in PD control and adaptive control that, that takes, uh, that, that's a, a quite lengthy, uh, lengthy period. Uh, I'm just giving an excuse for uh, the very uh, large expression I'm showing you for the uh, control law. The signal U is essentially the ratio uh, between the uh, green and the red light uh, durations. Uh, this, of course, needs to be implemented uh, in a discrete PWM uh, fashion, even though I'm designing a contri continuous control uh, signal. The uh, control is of an output feedback kind. So there is a sort of an adaptive observer so that the control law is based only on the measurement of um, let's say the density or the velocity of the vehicles right at the ramp. So a co-located output feedback controller. There's a whole bunch of gains in these uh, integrals. These are the integrals over a time period uh, corresponding to the length of travel of the uh, input from the ramp to the beginning of the freeway uh, segment. That is what these, these integrals in time are. You can think of them as, as, um, uh, as uh, basically observer-based, uh, full state feedback based on adaptive observer states. Let me just de demystify uh, that. Uh, this should not be thought of as, as some time varying feedback. It's not, it's, it's, it's full state feedback of the state estimate, adaptive state estimate. The formula for these gains are given here explicitly and I've grayed them out because exactly what's in these formulas is not important except, uh, except one function, 
a function which is updated in real time. So just as in, um, let's say, pole placement control, indirect adaptive control, uh, you have to continuously uh, uh, convert the uh, estimates of the plant state through the solution of a Bezu equation into, um, into the gains of the controller. <clears throat> uh, uh, similarly here, uh, some online solution of a certain equation, a Bezu-like equation, if, if, if you will, needs to take place. So there's a continuous estimation in time of the state estimate theta two hat, whose time dependence I'm suppressing just for, for, for the clean, uh, cleanness of, of notation. And uh, this integral equation over the spatial interval has to be solved continuously uh, in time. Uh, if, if you've never dealt with, with these integral equations and you're seeing this for the first time, uh, the reaction may be, ooh, you know, that looks kind of tricky. No, this is actually, couldn't be simpler. This is <clears throat> a Volterra type of uh, an equation. You <clears throat> simply discretize in space uh, this portion and you update uh, K2 and, and the, the, there's almost nothing to the solution of this equation in real time. It's a linear problem. Uh, it's, it's essentially as uh, computing, uh, uh, computing a triangular uh, matrix uh, operation applied to a vector. Okay, so let me now show you uh, the simulations of this. So in the absence of control, uh, uh, the stop and go traffic even when you have very risk averse drivers who keep up pretty large distance and, 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 and drive fairly slowly, uh, will have an oscillation and that oscillation will either be persistent or at best will dissipate out for a very long time. Please note here the time. We're talking you know, more than 10 minutes for a stop and go that has ensued to gradually um, uh, decay. Uh, the simulation is done on a, on a one kilometer stretch of freeway. In the presence of adaptive control, uh, this oscillation is suppressed and the driver's uh, behavior is steadied out uh, with the help of an unsteady um, uh, manipulation of the ramp metering. So let's look at the numbers here for just a second so you, so you appreciate what it, what it, what it takes. Uh, so <clears throat> it, takes, uh, it takes about um, about two minutes for a car at that speed to make the one kilometer stretch of freeway in congested slow traffic. Whereas it takes about five times that much for the oscillation to be uh, uh, to be attenuated, and let's let's divide up. Let's understand what's happening. This is adaptive output feedback or adaptive observer based control. So there are three elements here. There is the state estimation. I'm sorry. There is the parameter estimation. There is the state estimation, and there is control. As you know, they all act simultaneously, but they do not succeed simultaneously. Uh, it's really the estimation that needs to produce good enough uh, uh, parameter estimates uh, that, that comes first, then the uh, adaptive observer uh, improves, and finally the control does its job with uh, parameter estimates that are good enough and the state estimates that, that are good enough. So these are not, not uh, totally separable intervals but nine minutes really is an addition, the sum of these three actions. So that's, that's what it takes. It takes, takes about five times uh, the travel distance through the, through the freeway to, um, uh, to suppress stop and go. Now, this is an adaptive control seminar, so let's review the ad adaptive part. What are the update laws? So the update laws, except for the fact that they are for uh, for parameters in PDs, and those parameters are not, it's not a vector of parameters, but it's a function of the spatial variable 
it's a functional parameter, which is no big deal. It's it's you can you can think of it as an infinite dimensional vector. Uh, that parameter estimation is in a form uh, that is um, that is quite quite familiar. There is an adaptation gain. There is a normalization that I will show you on the next slide. There is a regressor, which is this uh, measurement of the output where the output is, is maybe the density of the, of the ramp or the velocity of the ramp. And there is an estimation error E. So uh, it's clear what Y is, all that is not defined, all that I have yet to define is the estimation error. So the estimation error is given by this expression. This expression is what you would, um, what you would normally obtain when you're doing um, uh, indirect adaptive control on uh, some model to which you've employed filtering so that you convert a dynamic um, a model that is linearly parameterized in, in parameters into a static model and you just uh, produce an output between the measured output and the representation of the output, the static representation of the output, output in terms of the, the filters. So it, it looks compli complicated, but conceptually, it's 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 the commonly uh, used uh, thing. And finally, there is a normalization. Uh, the normalization is is based on on uh, on the regressor on on what and um, uh, and is again common. I want to show you, uh, having shown you the simulation uh, that. Uh, well, let me go back to this. Having shown you this, this simulation in which the adaptive controller has worked, the adaptive output feedback controller has worked. The question is how much has been learned? And as you know, as um, uh, researchers experienced in adaptive control, uh, you know that you don't expect that these, these parameters have been fully learned. Uh, in fact, the learning of the parameter uh, functions uh, theta one of x and theta two of x is far from perfect. We have just improved uh, the initial estimates enough so that the controller can succeed in suppressing the oscillation. We're far from having the persistency of excitation here to, um, uh, to achieve perfect learning. In fact, the persistence of excitation uh, in uh, a traffic where we have infinite dimensional parameters would have to be so high, so rich, that that would translate most likely into a lot of traffic accidents, uh, a lot of uh, large displacements uh, and, and uh, close encounters between, uh, between vehicles. Um, <clears throat> All right, so let me now switch gear, get, uh, gears to another topic of mine, which represents the op uh, optimization in the title, extreme seeking. So uh, given how widespread extreme seeking uh, has become, I should probably not belabor the basics. So it's incidentally the 100th anniversary since the, the invention of this algorithm by LeBlanc in uh, France. Uh, and the basic algorithm was conceived for finding the maximizing input into an unknown operating map whose output is measured. The algorithm being of quite uh, being of an, uh, being uh, 100 years old uh, is very simple and takes takes uh, uh, very little in terms of of the uh, electronics implementation needed. It, it involves one integrator, which uh, we would think of as expected, given that we're doing some form of adaptive control. So uh, uh, a theta head dot is a must in here. Uh, uh, and in addition to that, perturbations are employed. One perturbation that is additive and applied to the input of the um, operating map uh, and the same perturbation uh, acts multiplicatively on the measured output. And the crucial thing is that the multiplication of the measured output to whose input 
uh, that sinusoid is applied represents in an average sense, uh, an estimate of the derivative of that function or in the vector case, the gradient uh, of that uh, unknown map. So, <clears throat> Uh, I'm not the only one who has paid attention to, to the evolution of extremum seeking in, in, the, in the recent uh, quarter century. Uh, uh, again, interestingly, exactly a quarter century ago, uh, I was intrigued by this algorithm, which was shown to me by a, a person in, in combustion engineering. And I was fascinated and very unsettled that something so simple works uh, so magically. I truly uh, consider it magical because I didn't understand how it works. Not, no Lyapunov-based uh, techniques that I, was, that I had mastered by, th by then could explain uh, how that algorithm uh, works. Finally, after you know, some period of, of uh, looking at it and struggling with it, I found a, com a proper combination of uh, averaging and singular perturbation analysis techniques uh, that uh, prove stability of this algorithm uh, in, in the presence of uh, basically arbitrary nonlinear dynamics on top of the, uh, the operating map, as long as the dynamics are, are stable. Uh, so following that, there's been a lot of interest uh, in, uh, in extreme seeking completely unanticipated. I thought for me that this was just, just a one-off one uh, curiosity that I had to uh, to satisfy uh, people who 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 count these these papers have have been counting on counting an addition in recent years of about a thousand uh, papers in extremum seeking source seeking and Nash equilibrium seeking per year. So there's a total of about twelve twelve thousand papers uh, now since that that proof of, of stability. Early uh, into my uh, study of extreme of seeking, I put out what I, uh, together with, uh, with a student, um, uh, Karti Carrier, we, we put out uh, a book summarizing the results from maybe the first five years of, uh, of various generalizations, extensions, and, and, and proofs, and so on. Um, uh, uh, something a few years later, prompted me specifically the mention of John Doyle of the possibility of interpreting the motion of uh, E. coli bacteria using extremum seeking prompted my interest in uh, uh, developing stochastic extremum seeking and with a, a postdoc, Xu Jun Liu, uh, uh, we uh, developed stochastic version of, uh, of extreme seeking and the underlying averaging theory that was needed to be developed uh, in order to study those, uh, those algorithms. So uh, let me show you one application of stochastic extreme seeking to a game scenario, uh, which we call uh, Nash equilibrium uh, seeking. This is entirely model free, completely different from, from the backstepping designs that I was talking about before. So uh, what is, what am I referring to as the game, game scenario? Suppose you have two players, maybe two uh, participants in an economic uh, competition, two manufacturers of a similar product who are competing uh, for uh, customers, for buyers through pricing. Uh, if your price is too high, you're going to sell fewer uh, items. If your price is too low, you're going to sell, sell a lot, but at a low profit. So there's a sweet spot, and that sweet spot depends on also on the competitor's price, and it also depends on the preferences and tastes and the reactions of, of human beings, which you have no a priori knowledge about. You can only guess how they might, might respond to, to, to pricing. So uh, what I'm showing here is... Uh, worked with uh, Paul Frihoff, uh, a student of mine, Tamer Bashar, uh, a senior colleague, and Shujun Liu, uh, whom I mentioned earlier. So I want to uh, stress that the output map of each player, where the player measures only their own profit, J1, uh, is influenced by the other player. And uh, the, uh, the maps are not known, 
And it's not the maps that are even being learned. That's the thing in extreme home seeking. You don't, you don't try to learn the map. You just try to learn, you don't try to learn a function. You just try to learn uh, the uh, maximizing uh, value of the input to the function. Uh, what else, uh, I'm sorry, let me just get back. Uh, other than uh, these comments, these, the, uh, the algorithm is essentially essentially the same as as uh, as invented in 1922, except that uh, the perturbations being uh, inserted are filtered white noise or rather colored noise perturbations, which may go through unbounded uh, nonlinearity for the sake of the stochastic analysis being mathematically appropriately done. Okay, so <clears throat> here's the only theorem I give in, uh, in this talk. Um, uh, this is a theorem stating uh, uh, exponential uh, practical stability in probability for, uh, for a system of multiple extremum seeking algorithm players in a non-cooperative uh, setting. And what I want to, to stress here is the, the, the following. Under suitable assumptions, the error between the Nash strategies of all the players, this is a vector of player actions uh, relative to the unknown Nash equilibrium uh, choices for, for these actions denoted by, by stars. So the vector of those errors exponentially decays to some arbitrarily small residual value with probability one, with probability that converges to one as the filter acting on the white noise inputs uh, approaches infinite bandwidth. It is never meant, mathematically it is not permissible to apply white noise, but you can get arbitrarily close to the probability uh, one if, if the noise is increasingly less colored in these filters. Let me now uh, show you uh, some applications of extreme C. Uh, the first one that I will show is the most, the one that has been the most impactful economically, and more importantly, technologically. What I'm showing you here is something that's called, called a wafer scanner, uh, produced by a, a Dutch company or international company based out of uh, the Netherlands, ASML, which, um, uh, which produces um, this technology for, for the photolithography process, the key process in semiconductor manufacturing. So about 10 years ago, the Moore's law seemed like it just cannot continue on. Uh, it had gone on since 1965 pretty predictably, and it seemed like uh, it was running into physical limits until people had a quite wild idea of uh, using something that came out of uh, inertial fusion physics. And this is employing droplets of uh, liquid tin bombarded by lasers to convert this liquid metal tin into plasma and uh, harvest uh, the light that is generated uh, for sufficiently powerful light production for photolithography. This was going to be a tenfold improvement at that time, at least a tenfold improvement in the, uh, um, in the or a tenfold decrease in the feature size uh, of transistors compared to the previous uh, uh, light source technology. Uh, Paul Freehoff, uh, was a student of mine working in a San Diego company that, that was uh, then acquired by SML. And here's what uh, 
the discovery or the the idea and the patent and the technology is so you uh, what you what you see here is uh, a droplet generator where the droplets are of this liquid metal tin being fired at five fifty thousand droplets per second this is an incredibly rapid fire uh, let me remind you that that we can't even hear above uh, above uh, twenty thousand beats beats per second so this is so so rapid that, that it's practically inaudible uh, so these droplets are being fired they need to be hit individually this rapid fire of droplets needs to be hit by a rapid fire of laser pulses um, and once that happens each time this this happens uh, it, each time a droplet of liquid tin is blasted there is an emission of um, of this uh, extreme ultraviolet light uh, what is being controlled here it's two inputs uh, one <clears throat> stepper motor controlling the angle of this mirror and uh, uh, one piezo controlling uh, the focus of light through this lens so <clears throat> you have you cannot hit perfectly each droplet but you can iteratively adjust uh, the aim so that you hit many droplets very consistently so let me now go back to the technology the wavelength of the excimer light laser that is used to hit the droplet is 250 nanometers, whereas the light being emitted is 15, uh, 14 nanometers. So an order of magnitude improvement uh, in, um, in the wavelength. So what's the, you can think of this as, as a transformer of uh, the wavelength from higher, coarser to finer, smaller. Uh, so this has resulted uh, at the time that this technology was was invented in a 200 time density increase and this invention worked great as physics but it became a technology and a product that was being sold each of these life sources alone cost 10 million dollars it became a product that was being being sold only after numerous control approaches were tried they all were given up on and then extremum seeking was was uh, uh, was attempted, and it was obvious in retrospect that if you simply want to produce light consistently and at a sufficient intensity, that is the problem of optimizing in real time. Extremum seeking is uh, called for, and you certainly are not able to to model the fluid dynamics of uh, of droplets being blasted by lasers. And uh, and uh, and convert that into model-based controls. So this uh, <clears throat> this was this success dates back to 2013. It was immediately uh, transferred into into all the leading uh, 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 manufacturers of um, uh, of computer chips, and and uh, uh, probably your mobile devices today are based on on this technology. Uh, it has advanced considerably. Uh, now it has gotten down to two nanometer feature uh, size. This, this announcement is, is about a year old and IBM uh, reached this milestone. A similar uh, a foc light focusing uh, application of extreme seeking was implemented on the, on the Mars rover Curiosity several years ago by a former master student, uh, student of mine, uh, Walt uh, Barkley, and it is used uh, for remote testing of the chemical composition of rocks. Uh, and it has actually been used to, found, uh, to find an indication of water of, on Mars. I'm sorry. Uh, all right, um, I'm approaching the end. Uh, two more uh, examples I want to show you. This one is probably the most fascinating. And uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a mix of some work that uh, I've done with my students and recent work uh, 
by uh, a student at University of, of Irvine. In uh, interpreting the motion of sperm in finding an egg. This is specifically for sea urchins. It's not, it's this, the, this experiment is not for humans. It's for sea urchins. For, uh, the human process is more complicated because humans have fallopian tubes. Sea urchins don't have that. It's, it's a much simpler environment and simpler to see uh, this algorithm. So some years ago, uh, um, in working on, on the so-called problem of source seeking, uh, this set of co-authors, uh, Alex Schenker, a student of mine, uh, Hansberg Dur, a visitor of mine, and um, Eben Bauer at University of Stuttgart, we came up with what was finally the simplest possible form of performing source seeking uh, for non holonomically constrained vehicles, namely for unicycle models. And this algorithm uh, simply is the um, derivative feedback of the measured local concentration at the vehicle added to a non-zero angular velocity acting on a unicycle which is propelled at a constant uh, forward speed. This is super simple as, as a design. What's interesting in it is the analysis. The analysis is highly non-trivial and it cannot be done using, using the uh, uh, Krilov-Bogolyubov averaging type of integral um, averaging theory, but it requires the derivative-based averaging theory, namely the Lee bracket-based averaging theory. So this was published, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago. And then a student at the University of California at Irvine, who got familiar with that algorithm, but was also studying biology, noticed something that is impossible to ignore, namely the perfect match of the trajectories uh, in our paper with the, with the experiments uh, done for sperm motion. So you see how the sperm runs around in a circle and keeps drifting closer and closer uh, uh, towards, towards the egg. The reason why this is, this, uh, by, by the way, contradicts what you think about as sperm motion. We're all taught that the sperm motion is, is zigzagging, but, but uh, towards the egg. That's not how it is. Actually, they spin around in a circle. And the reason for that is that the sperm has only one flagellum, unlike E. coli, which has three flagella. Uh, a sperm has only one flagellum, which is, which is like a corkscrew, which rotates in only one direction. Uh, in human equivalent, this is like a swimmer with only one arm. So imagine swimming with only one arm and the other arm tied. How, what, what is your trajectory going to be? It's going to be actually in a, in a circle. So this swimmer uh, um, rotates the flagellum, but speeds it up or slows it down in response to the chemo attractive. And if there is anybody from, from Mexico, uh, credits are to UNAM, where, where this experiment was done and the connection was uh, with the source seeking was made by Mahmoud Abdel-Galil at uh, UC Irvine. Let me close with another fascinating uh, linkage to the same result of uh, um, extremum seeking based on Lee bracket averaging that I recently, uh, that, that was recently brought to my attention by a biologist, a plant biologist at UC San Diego. So uh, phototropism is a phenomenon that young plants, basically plants that are just coming out of the seed, very, very small, little beginnings of plants, uh, they have to move around in order to orient themselves towards the light. Uh, they are so small that they, they, they cannot measure the gradient 
by subtracting the light, the measured light intensity from from a multiplicity of their leaves. They have only one leaf, so they have to move uh, in order to estimate the gradient. Let me let me pause this. Let me pause this movie. So you will see <clears throat> this movement, the rotating movement of uh, of the plants, just just uh, as in the uh, sperm model. Let me run it for, for a bit longer. So you see how they, they rotate and how they start bending towards the light on the left. Just look at, uh, look at this one, for example, rotating and gradually bending towards, towards the light. Okay. Now, uh, almost everybody who saw this said, well, that's like the sunflower, but it's not. Uh, phototropism is, is fundamentally different from the so-called heliotropism, namely what the sunflowers do. The sunflowers are in a light environment, which is periodic between completely dark and light with a 24 hour cycle. And they have a 24 hour internal oscillator, which is synchronized. It's, it's like two nonlinear um, uh, nonlinear oscillators whose phases are being synced up uh, in, in, uh, by the biological circuit in, uh, in the sunflower. That's completely different than what we're seeing here. Here we're seeing a period of three hours this is called an ultradian biological rhythm as opposed to the circadian for the sunflower. And the light source is constant. So what we're seeing here in phototropism is not synchronization of oscillators, but it's extremum seeking, an example of, of extremum seeking. These two, these two uh, biological uh, examples were fascinating for me because prior to, to them, I had never seen extremum seeking in biological systems that is based on periodic perturbations. I've seen extremum seeking based on um, uh, stochastic perturbations. This is in E. coli chemotaxis. This is, as we know, in, in the evolution where uh, mutations are random and, and there is a slow, gradual uh, progress up the gradient. Uh, these are the first examples of periodic based um, extreme seeking. And, and I would say that, that uh, biology is an incredible area of opportunity for, for um, uh, adaptive control or for interpreting things uh, that uh, people in biology simply observe, but have no uh, explanation for how exactly they, uh, they uh, and what is, what is biologically going on. They know that these oscillators exist. They know about the sensors. They know about the chemistry. What's how the sensors are are, are uh, linked to uh, to the production of motion, but they they can't really explain why and how this this works. So with that, um, let me stop here. I apologize for for going a little bit over time. I think we started over time and started struggled a little bit uh, at the beginning. So here I am. Uh, I want to thank you for for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, now is the time.